What Mark said at the beginning, that we have had a greater adoption of the ERP cloud than he and I both expected is true. And there's a couple reasons why for that. So what are we starting to see? Well, first off, we had small or smaller medium business companies who were moving to ERP who frankly never had a data center. So their first choice was to move to cloud. We kind of expected that. The second category is what I expected most of, is as companies had ERP systems, ours or one of the others, they generally refresh those every three, five, seven, ten years. And I figured, well, once that upgrades refresh cycle comes along, they'd move to the cloud. We start to see a little bit of that. But what was surprising to me, at least, is the amount of companies who started to look at what was in the future. And they started to look at either they're being disrupted, they want to become a disruptor, or frankly, their business has changed so fundamentally from pre, pre Y2K, pre M&A, pre digital, pre you name it. Lots of companies are in this point where their ERP systems was either preventing them from that transformation and being the disruptor, or what was not enabling them to do so going forward. And so we've started to see this tremendous momentum moving to our cloud-based applications, much more so than we ever thought, because of these different business challenges. And you can see now that we've got a host of customers across, you saw the video from Carbon, but you can look at different sizes, different scales, international companies, smaller local companies, all moving to the cloud for different reasons and taking advantage of new technology. And the reason that is critical for all of you is when I talk to customers about the readiness of our applications, I often get asked, particularly ERP, I get asked in one of two ways. Hey, does it have everything I used to have? E-Business Suite functionality, PeopleSoft, JD Edwards, SAP, or other ERP systems? And my answer now is we actually have as much but a lot more. And I'm going to tell you about the more going forward. And we're doing it much faster. And that answer is partly based on, let's say, an academic exercise. Hey, we built the apps, we designed them, we know what was done before, we had like a checklist of things. But more importantly, it's built from that customers that, you, that I just showed you before. First 100 customers, early customers. First 500 customers, I'd say, how are we doing? So far, so good. People are using it. Now, as we are in thousands of customers and thousands of customers go live, I can with more and more confidence talk to just about any one of you and say, yep, ready to go. What is your problem? How can we get you ready for that next phase and the next evolution? And how can you move to the cloud? And how can we best help you for that? So what do we do and what have we done in that space? First, as you're well aware, we sit on top of the Oracle technology stack from the Oracle Foundation in infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, very importantly, data as a service, which I'm going to talk to you in a minute, and then finally, our SaaS-based applications. What are our SaaS-based applications? Allowing you to optimize your products, but more than optimize the products, we're adding new capability around uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, IoT, blockchain, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment. We provide a complete suite of applications. What you hear about in this conference are focused primarily on ERP, EPM, but it also includes supply chain manufacturing applications, HR, which includes, of core HR, talent management, payroll, and benefits, our CX, or customer service, our customer uh, CRM suite, which includes service, sales, marketing, and then, again, the data cloud underneath, which is really the secret sauce enabler in what, was, what is going forward. And over the last 12 months, since we have this conference, we've not only added feature functions to each and every area, we've added localizations to the financials, but we've introduced a host of brand new products, again, giving us confidence in that completion of the suite, and hopefully showing you, when we talk about speed of development and speed of change, this isn't the old days where, hey, these are new products and we've introduced them, and maybe a customer will download it in a year, and maybe they will go live in a year. These are new products that as soon as the product's out, they're in the next quarterly update, and our customers are starting to consume them today at a much, much, much more rapid pace than we ever could before, and you see it really across the entire suite. Okay, so now, let me slow down for this part just a bit, because I think this is important. People are talking about, okay, so now that we've got to the cloud and we have more frequent releases, what are some of the pieces that are coming? I'm gonna focus on just a few, and the important part is not only what we've done in these few, but how the process enables us to be ready and enables you businesses to be ready going forward. And I'm going to talk about AI, 
or machine learning, IoT, and blockchain. So let's start off with our AI and machine learning. And what are the components that you need for machine learning, particularly in the enterprise? Well, I've mentioned a couple of times data. So we not only have data from our, your uh, enterprise transactions, so they're your first party data. So we can leverage your data to make the applications more intelligent and eliminate transactions or at a minimum ease transactions going forward. And I'll give you several examples. That's part one that we need. The second part you need is compute power because in addition to that internal data, we're gonna supplement your internal data with a host of third party data. And I'll show you exactly what that means in a moment. So that means literally anything that is going on in the web that we have access to, we're gonna apply that data to and have the horsepower in the cloud to make our application smarter. And again, I'll follow up with examples in a moment. Now we've coupled that with decision science. So these are data scientists and business intelligence or big data technology that helps us parse that data very quickly and derive business decisions. But most important, we then have use cases within the applications that we actually apply that business intelligence to and that big data to give you recommendations. And then, based on the success or lack of success of those recommendations, we tune the algorithm. So the application gets better and better and smarter and smarter as we go. Now Mark talked a little bit about this at the beginning, which is you're not necessarily gonna see different applications. You will see a few of those. But what you're gonna notice most off is what I call, what we're calling pervasive AI or pervasive machine learning throughout the applications. Now I said I'd give you some examples, but I'll give you some examples you see without using Oracle apps. So those of you who have a smartphone, you have three very recent examples. Number one, now when you type an email to somebody, you probably notice you get suggestions. Suggestions on who else you wanna send it to. And even if we're in the same company, even in the same organization, the people who I send email to and then copy people are very different than you. It's tuned based on the data and based on, guess what? When I add those people more to the CC list, it suggests them more. When I drop people from the CC list, it suggests them less. It learns as it goes. Second example you see in your everyday life is your texting. You have text and it has auto-suggest or auto-fill. Once again, learns as it goes, once again tuned to your personal use case. I'm pretty sure in this group, I happen to have uh, used the word fusion a lot in my uh, t texting for some reason. I often uh, use the initials of my boss a lot too. Um, so I get autocorrected to those. I don't know anybody in the audience who have an autocorrect and has autocorrected to TK probably more than I do. It is learned, it is adapted, and it is suggested, and it's more and more right the more I use it. Third suggestion is my favorite because it comes about bringing it full circle here in a moment. Now when I get into my car in the morning, it says you're gonna take 25 minutes to get to Redwood Shores in traffic. And if I'm early, it says faster. If I'm late, there's more traffic. I recently moved. Two days after I moved, when I got in my car at work, it said it's gonna take you half hour to get home, but it knew the new city where I was going. It learned, it tracked my location, it tracked data, machine learning, an application, and intelligence. So what are we doing it across the application? We're putting it everywhere. When you log into the app, you navigate. When consultants log in on Friday afternoon, it's a higher likelihood they're entering their time cards and their expense reports. When somebody is logging in the 15th or the 30th of the month, higher likelihood they're going to be uh, checking their pay stub. When accounts payables clerk logs in on Monday morning, 9 a.m., higher probability they're in to process suppliers or look at invo overdue invoices. Based on your role, the context, the time of the day, the year, or the quarter, we can better give you navigation. Approvals, we used to the design of approvals. What do people wanna see when they do the approvals? And I said, well, I wanna see on a promotion, I wanna see if there's a salary adjustment, uh, I wanna see the tenure of the person, et cetera, et cetera. So we went through, and that was really old school design thinking. What does the user wanna see? New school design thinking is, you know what I really wanna see when I do approvals of any kind? Job offers, transfers, POs, invoices. I wanna see anything that's exceptional in that approval request. And we can do that, because now we can look at data, every transaction that I've ever approved, and we can say, hey, guess what? Out of most of these transfers in Steve's organization, hardly ever does it have a salary change associated to it. 
This one has a salary change. I want to make sure to surface that in my notification and make sure that's apparent. When I approve a purchase order, here is the threshold. Here's where it is to budget typically. This is what I want to show. And even further, to give recommendations. Most of the approvals of all of our organizations get, uh, pardon me, most of the approval requests get approved. But what is it unique about those that get sent back or sent for questions? And we need to categorize those differently, put them in a different column in your UI, and give suggestions. Navigation, approvals, filling out every single form, every single list of value, everything you use in our system, turning it from a insert and validate application into a push and suggest application. And just like you saw on your phones where you see AI popping up and you just use it one day and little by little it's there and little by little it gets better, the way we're going to roll out pervasive AI is we have quarterly updates in the cloud, you're going to have feature after feature after feature implemented, all of which machine learning techniques behind the scenes, and over time that'll just get better and better and better. So pervasive AI. Another thing you're going to see then is, I alluded to this just at the beginning, it's going to change the way you interact and interface with the applications. Because when you start to narrow what you need to do in a, a transaction, all of a sudden different user interfaces become possible. So chatbots, if you can now communicate and complete a transaction or complete a query, in a few simple steps, as opposed to having to fill out a long, elongated form. Because the system knows once you have a few filled in, it could default the rest. All of a sudden, the possibilities of dealing with a query or a transaction via SMS or via a messenger technology, whether it be Facebook or any other, and having a chatbot interrogate you two or three times, you can get through transactions much, much quicker. When you have things like augmented reality coming out from technology providers like Apple, where you can overlay an iPad over a machine on the shop floor and see data about what's happening there, and the data you want to see, because it's exception data driven from artificial intelligence, we can change the paradigm at which the applications deliver to you data. So very tied in the hip. You're going to see pervasive AI, new messaging in AI. And then the last thing you're going to see is brand new application or application components, so things that we never had a chance of delivering to you before. Mark talked a little bit about the talent management. Make sure their candidate sourcing is aware of third-party data. On the financial side, allowing you to have uh, adapt to buying signals or how you deal with your suppliers or how you deal with um, trading networks, where it may be useful for you to take a, uh, an early payment discount, where it may not be useful to you, depending on your cash management situation, and applying machine learning to brand new functions or brand new recommendations throughout the set of uh, applications that we have. And then you're going to see these really across the board and again rolling out quarter after quarter, piece by piece, just making the applications a little bit smarter, much more push, much less you insert and validate. So that's machine learning and AI. Quickly with blockchain, I agree with what Bill's comment. Lots of different interesting uh, uses for the technology very much uh, not really understood. And what we're starting to do blockchain is especially around interaction with your trading partners, whether that be purchasing contracts or the contract negotiation, or as was mentioned before, supplier settlement. And really blockchain is really at its infancy. And what we're doing is focusing a lot on where it gets updated, leveraging our underlying technology, and delivering that quickly and adapting where the use cases pick up for blockchain. And then the final area is really uh, IoT or Internet of Things, which is, to my mind, just a sophisticated use of machine learning. We have the ability to ingest vast amounts of data from sensors, either within your shop floor manufacturing of or of your products themselves. Again, collect that big data uh, using both technology and as well as our data scientists for analysis, and then generate intelligent recommendations for your business, whether it be asset monitoring, production monitoring, fleet monitoring, connected worker, or service, all of which available today. Now, I said at the beginning of this, the important thing is not so much the individual technologies, but it's the speed of the innovations and what's coming. Because two years ago, we announced some of these things. The reaction from, from our customers was somewhat uh, happy, but, but more lukewarm. Last year, when we talked more about these in depth, the reaction changed completely. It went from, yeah, we might look at that, to where have you been? 
we needed this a long time ago, within a year's term. So the ability to change going forward, and guess what? Two years from now, it might have been on Bill's chart of the technology trends, I don't know what we're gonna be talking about. And that's the key. The part that the cloud enables is speed. And whether you are needing that speed in ERP to update your business processes from the pre's, pre Y2K, pre m and pre et cetera, whether you're using it to become the disruptor in your industry or whether you're using it to, um, to prevent the disruptor in your industry, moving to a cloud is the enabler. And all of this is true, not only for the traditional Oracle applications in the cloud, but we've taken all of those components and applied that to our NetSuite customers. So I know we have a good constituent of NetSuites, and the exact same thing I said is true, integrated and sit on top of the Oracle uh, traditional cloud, as well as the NetSuite cloud for ERP components. And we have lots and lots of customers that do this. I will just leave you with one, at least for a personal sense of pride, but I think it's a great, uh, story. Now, this is the Oracle example. So Oracle's converted over to our cloud end-to-end, -end, HR, financials, uh, CRM, which you may be sitting there saying, yeah, of course Oracle's going to run Oracle. That part is easy. Vendor selection wasn't tough for us. But <laughs> we are a $40 billion company. We are 150,000 uh, employees more. We operate in basically every country in the world. We are a hardware company. We are a traditional software company for license. We are a services company with our Oracle consulting business. And now we are a subscription SaaS-based company. All of it's done, all of our financials, all of procurement, all of payables, all of the consolidations, one single instance globally, all running in our cloud. And when I say our cloud, there is zero difference between the cloud that Oracle's instance sit in and the cloud that all of our customers sit in. And that's just one example of success. I invite you to talk to everybody else you're here at the conference and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much.